Welcome students, teachers, and the generally curious once again to the Constitution in American Life with the Friends of Publius. This is our third season of presenting thoughts, insights, and hopefully some diverse perspectives on topics determined by the Center for Civic Education's We the People, the Citizen, and the Constitution program. Along with our usual cast of characters, we are so fortunate so delighted to once again welcome our favorite guest to the program, Liza Prendergast, a alum from the We the People program from the great state of Massachusetts and currently the vice president of Democracy International, an NGO committed to developing a more peaceful democratic world. Welcome, Liza. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm sure you say that to all your guests because they're all wonderful, but I'm honored to be one of them. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, well, you're, wait, the only, you're, you're the only one that will tolerate being with us. So it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> everybody I, else is I, abandoned. I'm yeah, I'm oozing sincerity uh, here. I'm sorry. You know, I, I looked at the website uh, uh, for Democracy uh, International uh, today, and I had this really brief moment of of warm, fuzzy optimism, and then my natural cynicism kicked in, and uh, I kind of wondered, how do you guys measure success? Uh, you know, uh, uh, democracy and peace over here, check that box. I mean, what is the measurement of success for Democracy International? Oh, what a great question, Dave. And that was not a planned question. So I'm excited to uh, respond to it. Um, there, there are a few pieces of it. Um, one is that, you know, democratization in the world is not ours to measure. Um, it's democracies belong to, you know, the countries in which they're, they're owned and developed by their own citizens, and we support them. So um, I say that for two reasons. One, because it's true. Um, and two, because there's been a huge uh, sort of recession in democratization and democracy uh, for many years. So um, whereas I think in the 1990s, sort of democracy um, activists who were supporting democracy from the U.S., you know, overseas were very optimistic um, because there were, you know, more democracies, more countries becoming democracies. I think now a lot of the challenge is trying to not sort of recede, trying to stop some of the democratic rollbacks to protect the civic space that is rolling back. So it's not just about sort of advancing democratization, but it's trying to stop um, sort of regressing uh, in democratization. You know, I think we could use your organization's help in California. Yeah. California could, you know, use some help in, you know, de democratic, you know, democracy building and, and peace. Uh, well, there. And, 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 you know, Dave, I think one of the great things about um, an organization like Democracy International and other organizations that work on democracy issues is that we're honest with each other about our own flaws, you know, in the United States, uh, in our own democratic republic, and, and we have to be in it. That makes that much stronger when we have conversations with democratic activists overseas who are trying to, you know, figure out their own systems and, and governments and grappling with the same questions we're grappling with. Well, hopefully you guys are advising the State Department. Now, uh, we do work. We work quite a bit with the State Department. Yeah. Is this like a dream job for you? This um, seems like the perfect dream job for you. My number one dream job was to be a We the People teacher, and I did not make it um, because I the people I admire most are We the People teachers. Honestly, um, you know, it's what changes the world. I think teachers change the world. So this is if I had to have a second dream job, this is it. And yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. Wow, does that mean Flaherty was that good? He was good. He was very good. He was my We the People teacher. Taught yeah. me how to surf, how to drive, and how to think about civics. <laughs> okay, well, you know, 2023 has been a challenging year and it feels as if it's going to end, however, on a very positive note as the Dodgers and Brewers are preparing for the National League postseason while the Yankees, Red Sox and Giants are watching from their living rooms. All right. So that makes it for a very, very good year. It can only get better if the Cubs were in the postseason along with the Dodgers and Brewers, but that just guess wasn't meant to be there, uh, Professor Kavanaugh. And uh, we're all we're all sharing your pain. Although I'm again, I'm celebrating, you know, the absence of the Yankees, Red Sox, and uh, Giants. But uh, so 
While reading a wonderful article this morning on commemorating the American Library Association's Banned Books Week, our annual Banned Books Week, I was thinking back uh, to my youth and attempting to identify the book that either inspired more reading on my behalf or qualified as my favorite before I graduated for high school. So my my you know curious question for today's session uh, team is I'm curious. What would you? What, what was your favorite book before you graduated from high school? Either it was inspirational, or it just was. You know, it, it's that you know memorable read. It can be fiction or nonfiction. Uh, there that uh, that you know that 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 you know you still uh, remember fondly, Professor Williams. Oh, I think you're doing this just to set up for me to say something nice about you, even though you just grouped my Giants with the Yankees and Red Sox for crying out loud. <laughs> but okay, whatever. Um, my favorite book is one, I didn't actually, um, read it in high school, but you gave it to me and it's In Search of History by Theodore White. And if I was at my house right now, I would show you how it's prominent. It's out on my bookshelf and I have a picture of us at Dodger Stadium on top of it. And you, and in, you inscribed in it something, um, very meaningful and inspirational, just yeah, tell me to be curious about the world. And um, I've read that book, I think, cover to cover two or three times. And um, yeah, that's my favorite book. So thank you for introducing me to it, David. Professor Kavanaugh. Um, I'm going to probably have to go with uh, Indiana's own Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I've been a Kurt Vonnegut fan for a long time. And I think the first thing I probably read was Slaughterhouse-Five. And, and You took uh, mine. You took mine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, well, it goes. Uh, um, so little Billy Pilgrim, you know, I just, uh, want to get, um, from, from cover to cover on almost anything he's ever written. I just, I've always appreciated, uh, Kurt Vonnegut as an author. Do you have a second one there then, Professor Moore? Um, well, um, Cat's Cradle uh, is another Vonnegut, um, book. Um, here's the nerd, uh, uh, my dad, when I was about 14, gave me a book called uh, The Glory and the Dream by William Manchester. And it was a uh, it was a smart buy for him, for me, because it was uh, very breezy, you know, for a 15 year old, 16 year old kid. Yeah, it's it was wonderful to read. It was readable uh, and it wasn't a, it had a narrative. It wasn't a textbook. So I, I still have that on my bookshelf at the office. Um, and dad wrote a little inscription into it. So that um, that makes it especially. But uh, that that and, and Vonnegut is what I read a lot of in, in high school. Liza P. I think mine um, is Birdsong by Sebastian Fox, which is about it's a um, historical fiction about World War One. And it's about a, um, a soldier who goes through World War One. And I think in the U.S., we teach much less about World War One than we could, and the sort of effect it had, and the very like the effect it had on on development um, in Europe, but also on people. And it's a story of sort of one human living through this, you know, transformational era and his own like personal path through that. And it's a very powerful novel, but you also learn a lot about World War One. Oh, we shared something there. In fact, that mine was mine was World War II. Uh, it was, it, it, you know, it was historical fiction by Herman Walk, uh, The Winds of War uh, there. And, uh, uh, you know, and I've probably like, I've actually probably read that 20 times. Mm -hmm. I kind of do it annually. I, I, I read, I have a series of books that I read one time a year uh, there because uh, uh, one, the memory's going. And so, <laughs> Yeah, there's things. Oh yeah, well, okay. Yeah, I forgot about that part, kind of stuff. So, all right. Well, thank you for uh, sharing, uh, uh, Liza and Fop. So tonight, uh, in episode eight, we are going to be dabbling a little bit in American exceptionalism and discussing the influence of the Bill of Rights on the international community, as well as the current condition of human rights around the world. So let's begin our discussion with. No doubt. <laughs> the reason why she's here, and I, I, you know, unquestionably is is an expert in this area uh, as far as international uh, uh, development, uh, governance, uh, human rights, I think. Uh, so let's start with uh, Ms. Prendergast here. And I want to start out with some, I guess, some general understanding of, of, of the concept of, of human rights. So kind of a two-part question here, Liza. Is the concept of human rights an American construct to you, to, to, to your knowledge? 
Uh, and is it a is it a 20th century construct or does it predate the 20th century? So one, is it an American construct? And two, uh, does it predate the 20th century? Those are two great, great questions, Dave. And I'll start with two caveats. One, I'm not a historian. And two, I'm not a philosopher. I'm very much a practitioner um, in this field. So I uh, would respond to that from kind of that frame. Um, I did study democracy and governance, um, which the US government has kind of rebranded and how it talks about these issues as democracy, human rights and governance. Um, so it is, I think, a very important part of US foreign policy, which is how I interact with it mostly. But I think to your broader question, uh, no, uh, human rights are not solely an American construct. Um, the, the concepts of human rights that, um, you know, uh, Tim knows, and we'll talk about um, more than I will date back, not just to the Magna Carta and kind of that era, but to sort of freedom struggles that have happened um, around the world for many years. So whether it's um, freedom struggles for for colonized and oppressed, you know, people, particularly against colonization, as you know, is shared with with U.S. history, um, or or other countries, you know, human rights is not solely a U.S. concept. Um, also, if you look at human rights kind of from a philosophical uh, concept, as students have, you know, who have studied Unit 1, for example, and are looking at different philosophers, the idea of consent of the governed and the idea that there is a consent um, that as individuals or as groups we give to be governed is a very kind of you know, not just, an, of course, a, a U.S. concept. Um, so uh, the short short answer is no. I think a slightly longer answer is that um, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there was a big push in the United States for recognizing the concept of human rights as an important part, not just of sort of how the U.S. should organize its uh, role in the world, but how it should engage in creating a document like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, after, you know, extreme conflict and recognizing that having this kind of aspirational uh, document was beneficial, um, not just for other countries, but also for our own. Well, I, I, let me ask the political scientists here, Mike, I, I guess partly what I'm wondering is, is when does human rights language become part of the diplomatic community to the best of your knowledge? I mean, obviously in, in our lifetime, human rights language has been fundamental. Uh, you know, it, it really, I mean, and Eliza, I think, pinpointed a key moment is the, you know, post-World War II international, uh, you know, declaration on human rights, but also Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, making human rights a centerpiece there. But I, I'm wondering, does, as part of, if in the language of how we speak, you know, was human rights part of the diplomatic world predating World War II? Yeah, I think, so. I, I think so. But um, to qualify like Liza, I'm not a historian, but I, I do, I, I I play one in class, <laughs> but I'm not a historian. Um, yeah, I, I mean, two books come to mind, and they're both by um, Hosschild, Adam Hosschild. One is um, King Leopold's Ghost, and his other is the um, Bury the Chains, I believe it is. And I think that's the title of it. Bury the Chains is about the anti-slavery movement in England, and King Leopold's Ghost is about King Leopold in Belgium. And in both those instances, um, you know, it's a minority of the population. It's a, it's like advocates. They're a small group advocating for human rights in a world, in a culture, in a system where most people didn't have that language or even, frankly, believe it. So I'm kind of, I'm constrained by the fact I'm not a historian and that I only speak one language, English, right? So I don't know what there is in other languages or what I've forgotten. Um, but in my mind, Folks who were advocating against slavery, and maybe Tim and Chris can can fill in some historical details here. In my mind, those were human rights advocates, even though they might not have been using those terms, but they were making the argument that all human beings should have some baseline of dignity and um, way of living. I think I'd, I'd, I'd add two things. I think um, Liza's point about the Enlightenment, uh, when you reference consent, I mean, the Enlightenment, one of the Enlightenment principles is universal truth. So I think uh, this commitment to universality uh, and all, you know, also within the Enlightenment, there were rights. So I think the universality principle in the Enlightenment combined with, um, you know, rights, I think it's, that's, that's a very fertile field for international um, 
uh, in universal rights. But I also think there's a, I mean, even before the Enlightenment, um, there are some folks dabbling around with international uh, uh, human rights across cultures. And a lot of those, uh, like Grotius in, um, oh, the other guy, uh, Pufen, Pufendorf, I think is his name. What a great name. <laughs> They're making kind of this uh, human rights argument, and they have a theological construct, you know, because people are are humans uh, in image in image bearers of God. There's something special about humans, and and um, you know, it's just a half step to get to articulating rights. So, uh, I think Gro- uh, Grotius and, and Pufendorf make an argument that also combines theological principles pre Enlightenment or right around the Enlightenment. Yeah. So let's let's get into history just uh, briefly here, Professor Moore. So the English Bill of Rights was established in 1689, and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen was uh, established in 1789, and both uh, of which precede the Bill of Rights of 1791. So I guess my question is, what evidence do we have that the American Bill of Rights has any greater impact uh, than the French or English on 19th century constitutionalism and notion of rights of individuals? Um, okay, I got before I get to the answer, um, there is uh, American state constitutions actually were widely circulated in France. Uh, and they were reading the state constitutions, and they were quite enamored with a lot of them, especially Pennsylvania. They were really enamored with Pennsylvania. So uh, I would say, actually, the American state constitutions had somewhat of an influence, although I don't, I don't think the French Declaration of Rights is um, – there's a few similarities, but I think it's very different. But uh, so – and actually, the Bill of Rights actually was already uh, transcribed and approved by Congress. Uh, in in uh, in eighty nine, so it kind of pre it's I know it's ratified in ninety one, but it kind of predates it kind of predates well it does predate the the French uh, Declaration of Rights. So um, but um, so I don't know I, I had to I had to um, I couldn't help myself, David. I could of course not. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but your question is: Did the American Bill of Rights influence uh, have any influence? Um, uh 19th century i think it's kind of what you're asking right before we get okay. to a more modern era yeah. uh here and again you know where i'm coming from uh, my first sure. reading of this question was i was again this 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 uh, the, this presumption that we have that uh you know my gosh we're the city upon the hill for the rest of the world and we yeah. you know we are the you know uh, the 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 nation that influenced all of this sure. stuff well there's other nations that are dealing sure. with this and i so i guess i'm i'm kind of taking the question the task a little bit oh sure uh, um there so that's the spirit of it uh yeah but uh, i would again, say i would say um uh, in terms of europe it seems to me um uh, Napoleon's excursions around the continent, I think, have a tremendous influence on um, in in the mid nineteenth century of how they would configure constitutionalism. Uh, so, in, all that is to say that the French um, system had more influence than the American system in Europe. Although there was there was some um, interest in American constitutionalism, um, but I I um, I think. A lot of the influence in the 19th century for the American Constitution and Bill of Rights uh, was Latin America. And I think there's probably uh, one main reason for that is I think when Monroe um, decides to inform the world that the United States would kind of play a big brother, um, uh, kind of that's the Monroe Doctrine where we would play a paternal role in this hemisphere as a lot of revolutions are taking place in Central and South America, uh, South America. So I think the Monroe's kind of gesture of American assistance or paternalism, or you know, I know that's probably a big debate too about what, what actually Monroe was up to there. But I think a lot of Latin America looked towards the United States, you know, what, what's in your constitutional system? Because they're going through revolutions. Uh, and if America plays this leading role, so I think there's a, the influence, I would say, the way I look at it, is greater in Latin America than it is in other parts of the world in the 19th century. Uh, now, the irony is, and there's, there's uh, students should look this guy up. Um, I think it's Benito Juarez. 
he was a fascinating uh, guy in Mexico. Uh, he 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 believed in democracy and liberalization, and really had a um, not a direct influence on the Mexican Constitution, eighteen fifties, I think. But he had uh, these key principles of of um, of human rights, of equality. He also pushed hard to separate the Catholic Church from civil law, uh, ecclesiastical law. So I think there's some. He's a fascinating person to look at in terms of how much is he ingesting and picking up uh, ideas. And so, and, and as I understand it too, there's a big difference between. Uh, I think we maybe talked about this in previous episodes. The influence of ideas versus the influence of forms uh of structures so so i think when you look at latin america there's um there's a fair amount of influence even in argentina there's some stuff rumbling around there in the mid 19th century as well um they want to um kind of adopt some sort of a judicial review principle in their constitution mid 19th century so it, i think it's latin america that the influence is seen now is it successful? I mean, back to your original question to Liza. I mean, there's a lot of uh, falling short of you know what we might define as as democracy in Latin America. Um, but uh, I, I, the short answer is Latin America. I think is where a lot of the influence is in the 19th century. Well, is it is it, would it be accurate to say, Tim, that that because our influence is greater in uh, in 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 Central and South America and the Caribbean region, that as they turn to new constitutions, they follow our model and make presidential systems. Are a majority of them presidential systems, or are they? Um, yes, I think Latin America in, in the nineteenth century. I think they do follow a presidential model. Now they've gone through um, because of the, the rise and fall of constitutions in Latin America. I don't. I don't think they've hung on to the presidential system nearly the way uh, they did originally. That's I don't know. Mike might uh, or Chris, Liza. I I don't. Um, I have to be careful with my answer there because I'm not sure I'm right. No, they uh, there are more presidential systems in South America than you're going to find in Europe. Or I mean, certainly I think obviously our focus so far has been Western Europe. Uh, you know, I, I rely on Mike for any knowledge from African kingdoms to think about something like that, or in the Far East. You know what what happens there, but in the South America. But the other thing to think about with South America, if students pursue this, is um, going back to the Monroe Doctrine. And ever since, we've kind of had our fingers in the pie uh, in different governments uh, based upon what was good for us, especially during the Cold War, uh, when people might be leaning a little too far to the left. Uh, I, the United States has been known to um, uh, change governments that are not our own because they were not in our best interest. So that that creates certainly some uh, instability in those some of those regions, especially in South America. And, uh, you know, it leads to anti-democracies. Uh, well, see, see Pinochet. Well, I, I guess, you know, kind of feeding off of Tim, you know, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent can we call, is the Monroe Doctrine in any way, shape, or form an expression of, of protections? Of, of of constitutional rights is is the Roosevelt corollary. I'm, I'm I'm trying to before Wilson, all right. Obviously Wilson, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the in the 14 points peace plan, the uh, peace plan, and and uh, and he talks about you know uh, you know human rights uh, within his his administration there and promoting those. Whether he does so again is another question. But I'm wondering before Wilson, do we have any kind of you know, a statement as a nation uh, of promoting human rights. I, and again, I think the Monroe Doctrine, did we hide behind that, that we were we were helping these nations promote democracy and ipso facto, therefore, human rights uh, uh, there, Tim, Mike? Well, Chris? yeah, I think the, the language of human rights is not there, but just the mere fact that there was going to be uh, a, an encouragement of representative systems i mean he he Monroe takes the 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 european continent to task because they have monarchies and monarchies uh do do crappy stuff uh, first of all they have colonies and uh so i think latent within monroe doctrine there's a principle of promoting representative government 
um, and I think representative government, you know, the, the door, the door is ajar and you're, you're just a half step from, from a commitment to a rights regime. I think if you're committed to a, a representational system. Layton is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that statement. <laughs> well, I, well, okay. I know, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're going to invoke the 20th century here in, in, in oh, and, it, and it's a fair, and it's a fair thing. I, I understand I, that, but, uh, I think, the 1800s. Uh, if we just look at the text and look at what, in fact, Bolivar, uh, Simon Bolivar, he looked at this system and he he was uh, favorable to the Monroe Doctrine, but he also looked at the American system and said, I'm not sure your system will work down here. <laughs> so he, I mean, to Liza's original point that, the, that there's a, there's some variations of what uh, democratic systems would look like. And Bolivar was the first to notice that. Uh, but I think I I want to be a little favorable to Jimmy Monroe uh, or Jim, yeah I I do. Uh, I'm wonder, uh, I'm wondering though how do, should we how do we disentangle we talk about human rights I mean the private property and the mm. opening up of markets I mean Tim I'm you've really influenced my thinking when you've said on numerous occasions how it's a commercial republic that's at the heart of the founding. I don't know enough. I haven't reviewed the Monroe doctrines to know, but I just can't help but think that a lot of spreading civil and political rights is also buck. It's also in the same bucket as private land and open markets and let us trade and let us or let us exploit whatever. Right. And I, am I, is that part of it? Is that part of the, part of the bucket? Well, I would, yeah, I would say, I mean, the primary goal is a foreign policy goal to, to inform Europe. Now, whether we had the muscle to actually do this or not, it's a different issue, but the statement was to keep um, co uh, colonialism and, and, uh, mercan and mercantilism mm -hmm. out of this hemisphere. Uh, so there's a latent commercial, <laughs> there's a latent commercialism in that, you know, maybe a latent free trade principle. Um, but it was a, it was a, he, he created these two hemispheres There's a good hemisphere and a bad hemisphere. And we're going to be in charge of the good hemisphere and the bad hemisphere does colonialism and it runs over people's, um, you know, economic didn't use the word rights, but their economic interests. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think there's, uh, I think it's a foreign policy statement, but I I'd say we're a half step from kind of a democratic statement mm -hmm. or and, uh, another half step to rights. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Has a nice, has a nice Hi, on his face. Oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, ju I'm just, uh, you know, first of all, uh, we could not enforce it. We needed Great Britain because we did not have a navy. Right. Uh, the other thing is, you okay, all you, you European monarchies, you can keep your colonies that you have, just no more new colonies. Right. I think, well, you I, want a half loaf or a full loaf? Well, I, I think <laughs> you have to. I, I, I would have to add on. Uh, one, the Spanish-American War and the Roosevelt Corollary, uh, because, you know, now we are the policemen of the Western Hemisphere, you know, the whole tell your troubles to the policemen, and which gives us the ability to interject ourselves in politics south of the border, regardless of what the people in those countries may want, regardless of the, of the ties that they may have to other European nations, we are going to be the... Uh, patriarchal power, if you will. So I think it much more to what Michael's uh, suggesting in terms of um, what's best for American dollars. So the, so Chris, the, the question that the students are asked to address, it specifically talks about the Bill of Rights. And my understanding of the Bill of Rights is that it was added to further limit the power of the national government and to reinforce the concept of the rule of law. Uh, there. So, what is your feeling about the United States and uh, uh, and proponents of the rule of law? Uh, have we provided the world uh, uh, solid examples of what it is to govern by the rule of law, especially when we look at the area of rights? No. Okay. Good. Expand on that just a tiny bit. Well, I mean, let's think. Uh, we we have what we still have thirty people in prison in Guantanamo Bay. They've been there in depth. They've been there for uh, decades, literally decades. And some of these these men will never be set free. They've never seen a court. They've never been in front of any type of uh, counsel um, to determine it. And even though judges have multiple judges have said these people should be set free, 
um, we we haven't and we won't and we won't set the for any foreseeable future, even though a couple of presidents have tried to close Guantanamo Bay. I think that is a glaring example of, uh, you know, our, our commitment to human rights. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, you know, the whole concept of this rule of law and students, you, you know, the, um, you can go back to the founding era. I would say start with Thomas Paine, you know, in, in our country, the law is king. Uh, John Adams thoughts on government, you know, we're a nation of laws and not men. Uh, Federalist 15, Alexander Hamilton, uh, and even a great quote from uh, the first president, George Washington, under his administration, anybody in the executive office, you know, will be held uh, accountable for any wrongdoing. I'm paraphrasing a quote from Washington. So, you know, you, the, our founding era is is fraught with these examples of uh, the rule of law. But um, what do we have in 2000? We have a Department of Justice memo that says a sitting president can't be indicted. That's not even a law. That's not even a statute passed by Congress. This is a this is a memo written by somebody within the Department of Justice, and that certainly flies in the face of what Washington said. So I don't think um, you know. I've said this on this program before. We only follow rule of law when it's convenient. We see it being played out right now, you know, as we're taping this this program, um, we see it being played out right now to court in New York City with a former president, uh, you know, in a civil trial for fraud. Um, we uh, see a, a former president facing multiple indictments. Will that, you know, given given a fair trial in all these different uh, venues where he will be in on trial? Um, who Who's going to be? Will anybody be held accountable if wrongdoing is proven? So, well, yeah, yeah, Mike, I, I'm kind of wondering real quickly, given the question that the students are asked, what countries, if any, can we can we draw a direct line from the American Bill of Rights to uh, their enumerated rights? I mean, you know, Tim has mentioned constitutional structure in Latin America, and I honestly don't know anything about Latin America and whether or not they had bills of rights. I don't know what that was, but uh, that was a right reminder. My bad. Oh, okay, uh, Mike. That's such a good question, and um, I don't know if I have the answer. I mean, I don't have the answer. I don't know whether the Latin American constitutions had Bill of Rights. It's something that. Um, how about this? It's something I can look up and we'll put something in our, our notes about this, whether there's a resource on that, David. I'm sorry. I just don't know. No. Uh, well, well, and, go ahead, Liza. Well, well, I was going to add, because because I agree with Mike, I don't know. Um, but one, one of the things that I would encourage students to look at is the length of, of constitutions developed after the U.S. Constitution that talk about rights, whether it's a Bill of Rights, whether the rights are enshrined in the Constitution, because Mike knows this much better than I do. But I think one of the examples, like the South African example, there are a lot of constitutions that were um, drafted after our after the, the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights that have many more enumerated rights. And I think one of the most interesting things in the development of different constitutions is how countries choose to enumerate rights versus not to enumerate rights. So I think one of the interesting things for students to kind of look at as they're doing a comparison of constitutions is to look at the length, to look at, and that, I think that's one of the, the most interesting things is how, you know, how relatively short the U.S. Constitution is. And there, there has been an argument over the years that actually it is more important to enumerate as many rights as you possibly can. Um, and an example of this was you know, when, when Myanmar was going through its transition, which unfortunately has regressed significantly, um, there was an effort to enumerate kind of as many rights as, as you know, could, could be enumerated in the Myanmar constitution, but they weren't enforced. And there were many people who were not included as citizens to whom you know, they did not benefit. Um, so I think that's a really interesting line of inquiry for students. I mean, the Mexican government or the Mexican uh, constitution in 1857 had uh, right to bear arms, uh, freedom of speech, um, uh, abolition of uh, cruel and unusual. Uh, so there, there were a lot of language, a, a lot of language similar to the American Bill of Rights in there in that fifty-seven Constitution. That should be easy enough to look up as well. Yeah, well, I think that I, that's probably a, a key recommendation uh, for students uh, there, especially. 
uh, given that I think we've already made the argument that we are far more influential in our construct in the Western Hemisphere, you know, South, Central uh, America and the Caribbean, uh, is to look at some of those constitutions and, and, and see how, you know, you know, the direct, if, if there's a direct link there. Uh, especially when it comes to bills of rights and uh, the idea of individual rights within their constitutional uh, constructs. So, Professor Williams, um, I found this really interesting quote by uh, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, from 2012, and it it emanated out of Arab Spring and the overthrow of the Egyptian uh, government. And she suggested uh, uh, in an interview that nations seeking a new constitution might find a better model of, of constitutions that by examining the constitution of South Africa, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, rather than the American Constitution and Bill of Rights. Uh, are you on board with uh, Justice Ginsburg there? you agree with her? Yeah, I do. And um, I wonder if I'm going to get the same sort of uh, blowback that she got when she made those remarks. <laughs> and she did. She got a lot of blowback from um, mostly it was like, I guess, conservative media in America. But I think it that's something just I think the students should think about, like to even dare say there might be a system that other places should adopt um, gets maybe people upset. But I, I think this is where I have something to say about those examples, but I just also want to bring in something that I was thinking as as Liza was talking. And we're talking about constitutions, but uh, we, we've mentioned on this show before constitutionalism. And that to me has something to do with how cultures, histories, and then these processes and structures you set up, how they fit together, right? And I don't think there's anything wrong with the United States to say, we have a system that works really good for us. And it won't work good for you because you're not us. I think there's a way to say that in a way that's not um, like that we're the best. Um, and I think there's a challenge to that. I think you could ask, is the system that we set up the best for us right now? Right. We've talked about that in other shows. I think that's a debate. But I think there's a way to, sh to, to make a statement like Justice Ginsburg the, did and to not immediately feel like that she's not a patriot. Um, and I think to just build on what Liza was saying, I think there's a couple of reasons she would say that in the context of Egypt, rather than other than just that Egypt is a completely different culture, has a completely different history than the United States. Um, let me just focus on a few of them. Um, well, first of all, I, I would I would recommend the students pick up a book. We mentioned this last year. It's by Roosevelt Kermit the Third, The Nation That Never Was. Uh, we'll put that in the in the notes. It's a great book to think about American history and 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 where our constitutionalism actually starts, right? He argues it starts at the end of the Civil War. But if you in the original constitution, what's missing there, right? And why would a country not wanna adopt that? Well, there's no mention of equality, like in terms of equal, equal protection of the laws. There's no right to vote, right? Um, I was just visiting a colleague's class today. He was talking to some freshmen about um, Shelby Counter v. Holder. And these students were like flabbergasted that that um, um, not only like that what Shelby decided, but also just the history of what happened after the Civil War and that all that stuff. So those are two things right there. Um, then there's the the socioeconomic rights. I mean, um, in terms of positive rights, a right to things other than civil and uh, political rights that many constitutions have today. That I think if you're developing a constitution today, you'd want to think about. And then finally, the Consti the South African constitution, the Convention on European Human Rights, and the Canadian Charter all have language guiding courts and legislatures on if you're going to limit a right, how do you do it? And this is something that we just have been making up as we go along in our common law tradition. And it leads to some... Um, I don't know, to some odd decisions on which rights we we limit more than others. So for those reasons alone, I think that, that Justice Ginsburg is on the right track by not just copying and pasting the U.S. Constitution and plopping it down in Egypt or, I don't know, name the country you want to plop it down in. So I, I'm curious, is it just kind of academic, academic intellectual popularity that we find constitutions of the 20th century uh, develop more positive rights 
or is it is is the you know the fact that that our constitution presents rights more in negative language congress shall not uh you know government shall not do these things uh you know is, is it about culture and tradition of a nation that leads them to to create a, a different sense of rights or is it an intellectual kind of thing is that question making sense mike no, it does. And I'd love to hear what others have to say on this. I think that, and Tim and Chris, please check me on this for the past. And then Liza, check me if, on this for other countries that you know better than I do. But the foremost item on the founders' minds was not rights, it was state power. And embedded in our history is this um, fear of too much state power. And in the 1700s in Europe, not all of Europe, but in different places, there were debates around what we would call positive rights today. Just this idea that governments as representations of the people should have more of a say in people's lives for the good of the people. Those types of debates happen differently in Europe because of history, because of culture, than they did in the US. But I don't think that's a direct reflection on thinking about rights as much as it's a direct reflection thinking on the the question before that, which is what's the role of government, <laughs> right? That's the starting place. And then if you have a different view of that, you're going to maybe develop some different types of rights. I mean, I've often, go, go ahead, Liza. Oh. Uh, I have often, a thought, but I'm, go ahead. I have, I've often thought that uh, in the American context, we got real interested in negative liberty uh because we had stuff <laughs> i mean it was uh compared to europe there was a lot more um property being owned by people i think there's a natural tendency and this has nothing to do with constitutionalism per se there's a natural tendency if i got stuff i want to put some limits on on the entities that could take it so I think, uh, you know, I mean, Locke frames it all within the concept uh, context of estate uh, property, mm -hmm. the, the life and the liberty kind of emanates from that. So I think our commitment to natural or to negative liberty uh, drives us to want to restrict government, whereas I think in so many places, uh, there's not there hasn't been economic pay, uh, uh, prosper a minimum level of prosperity for for negative liberty to take root because nobody has you know the ownership principle isn't there so uh, so i think the the opportunity for government to act to provide stuff i think makes sense um whereas in countries where maybe there's more widespread property ownership the negative liberty concept is very very easy to get to so professor kavanaugh um again it, the question presumes, uh, I, it, to me, it takes it, it presumes a, a certain. I'm sorry, but American arrogance uh, uh, here, uh, and and it, it implies that America has been a shining light advocating for human rights around the world uh, here. And uh, uh, do you agree with that? Do you think America has been a shining light for human rights around uh, the world? It, sort of. Um... You know, I'm going to go back to the the book that uh, Mike mentioned a, a few minutes ago by Professor uh, uh, Roosevelt. Um, and you know, when when Jefferson is writing this, you know, uh, what Tim's boss John Kaminsky has called perhaps the greatest sentence in the history of the world: "We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal." Who was Jefferson referring to? He was referring to that the colonists were equal to Englishmen, right? But from that statement. Uh, takes a civil war, you know, what, uh, 720,000 dead, 2% of the population. Uh, it takes uh, several constitutional amendments. It takes a period of reconstruction that fails in the end, ultimately. And we don't get till, um, I'm stealing Michael's thunder here, uh, 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. Do we actually become a nation where people have access to the polls protected by the government? How can we call ourselves a democratic republic uh, and, and, and making sure and when we don't make sure that all people have access to the polls? And as he just alluded to earlier, when you're talking about Shelby County versus Holder, what we've seen since then is we've seen a backsliding in terms of access to uh, 
to voting uh, enacted at the state level. So at times we absolutely have been uh, the shining city on the hill. And uh, uh, Liza is a great example of that. She's working with an organization that is out in the world trying to promote democracy and democratic principles uh, because there are people in this nation that believe that they are really important, uh, not just for our nation, but for the world and other people around the world. But, um, you know, we've been talking about these documents and I want the students to understand just because we put words on paper. Right. And even Dr. King said this. Right. Or, or before Dr. King, Frederick Douglass said this. Yep. yep. Do you have honor enough, courage enough, patriotism enough to live up to your own constitution? And so even though we put words on paper, the proof is in the pudding, to use that old cliche. So at times, yeah, we, we have. We absolutely we absolutely have had tried to promote the idea of uh, what we consider to be some of our fundamental values. But we need to make sure we check to see how well we've lived up to them. I think of the civil rights movement. I think of uh, the Freedom Riders. And so when people are almost burned to death in, in, a, in a bus in Alabama, in a bus in Alabama, and you know, and we're in the middle of the Cold War trying to hold ourselves up as this, as again the shining example of human rights and democracy, and yet you know uh, we have people that are trying to burn people alive simply because of the color of their skin. It was upsetting their apple cart. It was really easy for the Soviet Union to say, "Wait a minute, you guys want to call yourselves this great democracy? Look how you're treating a big part of your population." So, I mean, we have to examine our own history very, very, very thoroughly. And I think we're doing a better job of that now than we've ever done. But uh, again, just because we put words on paper, the proof is in how we live up to those words. Well, let me ask it this way. And, and, and Liza, I'd like you to kind of chime in based on what you do and your organization does. But from kind of a historical perspective, Chris, and, and anybody, of course, is free to jump in, to what extent does our failure to meet those standards at various times. As you said, it's kind of a, you know, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, but to what extent does our failure to meet those standards, has it hurt us, you know, from an international perspective, has it hurt our standing? Has it hurt our ability to influence events positively around the world? Do you understand, does the question make sense? Yeah. And here, here's, my, here's my framework, Chris. Uh, you know, whether this is apocrypha or not, you know, uh, apocryphal, I don't know, you know, which is the appropriate grammatical use there. But I've read numerous times about the dilemma we faced in trying to lecture Hitler on human rights and the the, the Jewish uh, uh, policies of the of the German state in the 1930s was, you know, his comeback was look in your own backyard that our racial policies, which the Germans got a lot of idea about racial policies from the United States, all right, that our racial policies undermined our moral authority, all right, uh, to lecture Germany about their racial policies. Has that been something that's, that, that is, is, has been problematical beyond that period, do you think, even would, in the contemporary period? I would rather, Liza, I think this is right in her wheelhouse because, I mean, this is what you have to, I would imagine you have to wrestle with this, don't you? Yes, almost every day. And it's exactly this question. It's how how can you possibly, you know, advocate and promote and advance democracy and human rights when in the United States you're you're failing, whether it's, um, you know, critiques from working with people who are trying to administer, you know, fundamentally free and fair or credible you know, elections and say, you know, look, look what happened in the United States when, you know, you held elections and, and major political leader, you know, denied that they, that they were free and fair. And it, it absolutely hurts our standing in the world without question. Um, it absolutely makes it harder to advance democracy and human rights without question. And it has historically. But I think um, a, a slightly more kind of optimistic historical perspective is that in the early 80s, the US Congress created and appropriated funds for the National Endowment for Democracy um, and for other entities. Uh, in the 1990s, um, the 
U.S. Congress appropriated funds for public facing human rights supports programs that anybody can look up, that you can look up, um, you know, it's in the public domain. The U.S. Um, in the 1980s recognized a lot of the chat that from a policy perspective, recognized a lot of the challenges that that Chris brought up earlier in the discussion related to, you know, efforts that the, the CIA uh, took to overthrow legitimately elected, uh, you know, governments in, in Latin America and elsewhere. Um, but the idea of the U.S. government publicly saying we're going to support democratization. We're not going to do it, you know, in in private. We're going to do it in public, so that there are public reports. There's something called the Development Exchange Clearinghouse, where students can go. It's a uh, run by the U.S. Agency for International Development. You can read reports about how the U.S. government is supporting human rights and democratic activists overseas. Um, I also uh, wanted to add that I think you know. It, in sort of framing how the US supports democratization overseas as a kind of comparison with our moral failings at home, I think you have to look at the individuals and societies that that we work with, for example, at Democracy International and other organizations and the State Department works with in defense. So one example, um, I recently had a long meeting with Bobby Wine, who's a, a Ugandan activist, Ugandan ac opposition political activist um, and has run for office multiple times. Um, he's been jailed and beaten uh, by the regime. Um, and there are many activists like Bobby Wine who are trying to stand up for democracy and human rights. And the U.S. Had, has, you know, in many different areas, tried to support them. So the State Department has issued uh, sort of diplomatic correspondence uh, related to that. Um, the development agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development, continues to support efforts to try to, you know, support democratization or to support the rights of LGBTQI, you know, individuals in um, in contexts where the, you know, the legal environment um, is incredibly repressive and Uganda is an example of that, unfortunately. Um, and, but the, you know, the efforts have to be grounded in humility. And, you know, they, they won't succeed if they're not, because, you know, for all of the examples that you've all, all given, the, the U.S. has to be humble in how it does it, and that we are all trying to improve our, our own democracy here at home. Um, and, and it's that sort of collective effort that makes us, you know, better at working with others who are trying to do, you know, push forward similar efforts. I have a question for for Liza as well. Do um, it's it's kind of prodded my thinking since we've been talking about like uh, abroad versus how successful are we here at home? Um, when when you uh, are working with people internationally, do they um, do they talk? Do they use language like well? Uh, it's almost like a cultural relativism language, like, well, you know, you have your rights regime, you have your way of doing things. We don't configure rights the same way you do. I mean, is there a do you hear like a I call it a cultural relativism argument um, that universal rights don't apply because there's differences within all these cultures. Do you hear that in your work? Yes, absolutely. Um, and and one example uh, is women's rights. For example, you know yeah. what what rights um, should women have? Uh, and I think, you know, their the expression, you know, women's rights are human rights. But I, I that was a, a sort of policy expression some years ago. But I think the idea of that is, you yeah. know, that um, there are things that are universal. So um, and and there's a pushback against that in some societies, um, and a pushback that. Um, you know, maybe that's, there should be, you know, differences and approaches. And I think it's, it's really sensitive, you know, personally, I, I come down on that, that there are universal human rights that, that women and, and men should be treated equally. And, and, but it is, you know, an on, ongoing, I think, conversation. Um, the other thing related to that, that I wanted to say earlier related to sort of the creation of constitutions and Dave, your question about Egypt is that I think it's, Egypt made me think of how, you know, looking back at when constitutions are created, it's easy to think that they're linear, that there was this process that was like pre or, or like destined that the constitution was going to go on this track. Um, and because it's history, you know, obviously we know great compromise and how compromise worked. But in the case of Egypt, for example, it was really messy. So Democracy International had an international observation mission. We observed the political transition for almost three years and it was messy. You know, it, it did not end well for dem democracy and human rights in Egypt, but it was really messy from the beginning and there were different actors involved at each stage. And one of the things that I would encourage students to think about as they're looking at different examples of constitutions is that they were not predestined. What is written there was not predestined, whether it was written, you know, our constitution or whether you're talking about the constitution of, of South Africa or of Myanmar, that the context of the, the political transition really matters in, in the outcome. 
Well, and I'm glad you said it. I, I think that's an important note, and I'm pretty sure that Professor Moore would agree that our Constitution was not predestined, and it was pretty messy uh, itself and still is <laughs> to some degree uh, uh, there. But uh, I also wanted to build on I, I, what, what Tim asked to Mike in South Africa. Do they have a, a concept of rights culturally that's different from ours? And so that conversation that you you would have with them, that has to be taken into account? Yeah, no, for sure. And um, to me, the most glaring ex examples of this is in their Constitutional Bill of Rights. Um, they protect um, marriage between heterosexual uh, couples as well as homosexual couples. They also protect polygamy as a customary practice. Um, they established the right to vote throughout the country and the right to vote in every institution from national to local, but they also protect hereditary chiefs as um, as having the ability to operate. And when I when I talk to South Africans about what seems to be to be a contradiction or some contradictions, they don't see contradictions. They say see it as both and. Like, why can't we live in a place where there's polygamy and there's chiefs and we have voting and we have the right to speech so yeah i think i i think you're right i think the students should really think about how much rights talk and um constitutions are so intermixed with culture and history and timing and what's available i mean if if uh i don't know if benjamin franklin could have looked in the future 200 years and, and saw what they were doing in constitutions in Eastern Europe, who knows what sort of like ideas he would have had for the American constitution. It just, there's certain things that just aren't out there, right? At certain points of history. And so we're constantly learning and moving. I don't know if we're moving forward, but we're constantly learning and there's new things for us to consider. Can I add to that really quickly? Because you made me think, Mike, that I think one of the benefits of studying constitutions and those kind of questions in other cultures helps them also explain or helps helps us study those sort of dichotomies, as you put it, maybe in our own or there's con those contradictions in our own. So, for example, it wasn't until 1974 that I could get a credit card as a woman in the United States. That's that's not all that long ago. Probably seems like a long time ago to students, but it wasn't all that long ago. Um, Heck, I got socks that old. <laughs> so your socks are are older than than for example your credit line card credit, yes a line of credit um but i think you know looking at historical examples in other contexts it, it helps us kind of say oh that's kind of weird and then when you start to see them in your your own culture or your own context you can sort of play that that you can kind of grapple with that in a new way which is a helpful thing when you're looking at other constitutions so liza with the context of, of what you do and your organization does I'm kind of wondering how do you how do you address I guess this necessary you know need to balance cultural respect all right while promoting human rights and democratic institutions and you mentioned just a few minutes ago the notion of women and women's rights or human rights but we know culturally around the world that there are a lot of communities societies you know, that have a very traditional outlook. So as your organization, and as you might say, the United States State Department is are engaging these, these communities, these societies, how do you balance that respect for uh, their culture with the desire to expand rights and democratic institutions? That's a great question, sort of at the core and fundamental heart of, of what we do. Um, I think, I mean, there, there are multiple pieces of it. One, I think being incredibly respectful of other cultures is incredibly important, um, recognizing that the, the form of government if it's a democratic government, is theirs. Um, but it's also critically important to understand sort of who's the arbiter of what culture means um, in a society. So whose voices are contributing to saying this is our culture, whose voices are excluded from saying this is our culture, um, you know, who is uh, at at the table, often literally a table when key decisions are being made, you know, uh, for example, in um, 
treaty discussions when a, a conflict is when a violent conflict is ending you know it's very customary to have the the two conflicting or three conflicting parties and I'll, I'll give the example of South Sudan to have three conflicting parties or two you know at the negotiating table to try to hammer out what a peace deal looks like to end the immediate conflict often many people who are affected by that are not at the table um, are not there to say, you know, this is this is important to to my community, or this is important um, to our, our women's association, or this is important for this, you know, minority group, minority religious group, for example, um, and trying to work with with um, civil society organizations and others outside of kind of traditional lines of authority, whether it's, you know, government authorities or traditional authorities, to make sure um, that they, you know, do have a role and are able to participate in, in processes, I think is incredibly important. And there are lots of ways to to do that. Um, and often it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be, it could be funded by, you know, US support, but it doesn't necessar necessarily have to be me as an American who's, you know, having or facilitating those conversations. Very often those conversations are, are led by, you know, experts within the societies in which they work who are activists for, for you know, different human rights. It's complicated. Yeah, can I ask a follow-up there? Because that really resonates in terms of who gets to say what the culture is. It's much easier when you invite in a group of men to say, what does uh, customary culture look like? I mean, easier in terms of like getting a consensus. Um, so I'm wondering in, in the in the places you've been where you've seen this happen. I'm just I'm just wondering, because in South Africa, they, off, they there were some voices in, but it was a very male dominated space, even during the transition, I would argue. Right. When you bring in too many voices is the is the fear that you're just never going to reach that compromise just because they're they're too they're so opposed right in terms of what the culture represents that there can't be a consensus that everyone can live with or have you found that actually it does get worked out and that those places become kind of like more solidified because they've had those tough discussions really depends and the, the like everything in democratization the process really matters so an example that came to mind with that question um is in bangladesh so uh in bangladesh politics is uh you know relatively zero sum um there are two primary political parties there's a smaller third political party um and there you know there are there's often violence between the two parties there's a, a strong allegiance between individuals and and the political parties that, that they belong to including for example you might go to a university that's primarily your political party like it's really it's kind of a funnel um and they are zero sum but one of the things that we found is that one of the things people care a lot about is their community so they want their trash cleaned up they want you know the um the the waste management systems to work you know people are incredibly concerned about climate change in bangladesh because of you know flooding related issues and and, and um i could go on and on about this but but um you know young people who are involved in these political parties we've been supporting dialogues with young people who are looking to rise in their political parties to talk about issues in their community so very much like the center's project citizen program kind of a similar it's not the program's not similar but the ethos is similar the kind of having these conversations about issues that people see um and that they think they can fix can can make it easier to have much more complicated conversations sometimes you have to do that in single identities first so sometimes it might be you know i kind of this, this identity priming with groups that that see themselves, you know, as the same, you know, as similar identities before you have those cross identity conversations to make sure that they don't turn either violent or disagreeable. But then, you know, issues related to, OK, we're going to work together on this issue in our community and then maybe have some success getting that trash cleaned up and then tackle, you know, more more, I don't know, controversial issues. So that's that's kind of a, a case study of an example, potentially, um, of one way to do that, where there may be disagreement in in what, you know, at the, the highest level, fundamental human rights looks like, but maybe not starting with those conversations, starting with the conversations about, yeah, we all want this trash cleaned up. So one last question before we close. I had mentioned earlier, uh, President Jimmy Carter, who's you know, uh, what, 99 uh, as of this last week, I guess. He had put human rights at the forefront of his administration's foreign policy. And I don't think I'm going out on a limb here to say that that pretty much failed. All right. Uh, uh, human rights at the centerpiece of our foreign policy did not last very long. Uh, and this is to anybody who wants to chime in. Any thoughts as to why that the Carter Doctrine kind of fell flat? Chris, you're you're muted. Yeah, sorry. 
Um, I, I kind of sticker because I have a poster in my classroom that has that quote, our commitment to human rights must be absolute, President Jimmy Carter. Um, and it's an interesting uh, photograph that accompanies him. It's an older woman and uh, sitting on a chair in her front porch that could be somewhere in any uh, downtrodden part of the world. Um, I think that he was also, uh, you know, the Carter administration was also a victim of multiple things in play at that time, whether it be the oil embargo, uh, it could be some runaway inflation, obviously the hostage crisis in Iran. Uh, there were, you know, multiple things in play during the Carter administration. Uh, here, you know, I don't know, honestly, that we've had a more moral person occupy the office of the White House than Jimmy Carter. Uh, truly, uh, you know, a moral person. Uh, and his compass, I think, is pretty secure. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not sure um, if that helped or hindered what he wanted to accomplish. But I do think that there were many other factors in play during his administration that probably kept him from being successful. I think, uh, well, I, I would say, uh, I mean, his racism aside, Wilson was particularly rigid morally as well. And he, I mean, his foreign policy agendas fail, fails as well. I think, I mean, I I, I know that quote, uh, it's a great quote, but I, I mean, I hear a zero sum in it. And I don't know, I mean, when it comes to international relations, it seems to me that like there's always a function of economic interest. And, and Carter, I think, believe rightfully inserts human rights into the equation of foreign policy. Uh, there's security. So there's several things involved in foreign policy. So to make uh, I mean, I kind of recoil at anything that's zero sum, which is odd because I'm zero sum in some parts of my life. But um, but I I don't know, Chris, I, I have uh, and maybe it's my natural cynicism about zero sum living. Um, but the zero sum nature of making human rights at the forefront, I don't know. Um, first, of all, I don't believe in perfectionism. So maybe that's a function of this, too. So to, to expect perfectionism. Well, well, let, let me ask. Can I ask you this? Professor Moore, uh, Chris, sure. go ahead. Well, I don't think I don't know that it was a zero sum with Jimmy Carter. I think it's just the whole idea. That, I mean, that he does say that we should. I mean, I don't. I don't. I guess in in my heart of hearts, I don't see the problem with making our commitment to human rights absolute. Um, because uh, again, as you said, though Tim, there are many other factors to consider when it comes but to, to your point, Chris. We have our own failings, so how can we make it absolute if we can't bat a thousand? I mean, there's always that dilemma. But I know, but that's the thing is, and this is what Liza said earlier, We, and, and I don't know if we said this during the recording, but we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we, uh, sorry, that we have to make sure that we're aware of our own moral failings, right? right? So we have to hold ourselves account accountable. And, you know, that idea of human rights are absolute. I don't think Jimmy Carter would say that doesn't pertain to in our own borders as well, right? I think it, yeah, that whole idea right. is that whole thing and i don't and i don't think you could mention wilson and then say discount the racism i don't think that i mean you, you, you can't look at woodrow wilson and not include the blatant racist sure. so but, i mean I, there's a, there was a rigidity of principle in his in his uh in his thinking with the 14 points and all of that that's what i'm referring to there is a difference go ahead liza go ahead liza well, I just want to say, can I make a case for for framing? Because I think one of the things I I tend to lean, not surprisingly, toward um, you know Chris's argument in terms of the you know the idea of human rights you know being the center of, of Carter's agenda. But today, I mean, the Biden administration has repeatedly said that democracy and democratization is at the forefront of its agenda, and I think there are a lot of parallels. Um, I think one one important point uh, to Tim's point, though, is that, and I made this 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 point in in previous sessions before, and would encourage students to look at it. Democracies make better trading partners with the United States. Democracies are less likely to go to war with each other. So, if a country is a democracy that protects the human rights of its citizens, which is fundamental to being a democracy, uh, or is striving to. Um, 
you know, they go to go to war less with each other. Um, democracies uh, tend to produce fewer refugees and, and migrants because there are opportunities for people to see themselves as in their own future. Um, so there are lots of reasons that putting democracy and sort of human rights as a critical part of democracy, I think, at the forefront of, of, sure. of foreign policy, because it also incorporates the idea that it is defense support. It is supporting, you know, trade. It is supporting all of these things that Americans you know, want in their foreign policy. But the frame is saying, you know, we have this responsibility and all of those things are secondary to it, not sort of before it. So democracy is first and our security is a critical part of that. You just articulated uh, one through five in Wilson's 14 points and much more eloquently, I might say. <laughs> Mike, well, there's evidence. Say... There's yeah. now evidence behind all of those points. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, you were going to say? I know. I think I was I think Liza just said, I, I was just thinking about the framing of it and how, yeah, I mean, we're debating right now in the news today was uh, George W. Bush's policy, PEPFAR, his HIV AIDS policy. And um, I don't know, I, I forget whether he framed that as exclusively as a human rights or a combination of human rights and economic rights. I mean, I, I think what made Carter so notable is that he so blatantly at the height of the Cold War just said, we're going to put this, it's going to be first and foremost on our minds, right? And I'm not sure that's why it failed or not. I, I think most administrations are weighing this. I think there's a way for Reagan that we could understand Reagan's policy as a human rights policy. I'm not saying I would believe it, but I would say like in tearing down- tear down this wall and and going after the communists and even supporting Contras, you could argue, is about human rights. You could, right? But what's interesting is that this is where it gets into politics. And despite that most Americans would be upset when Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, don't adopt our model, we also don't want to hear a president say, we're just going to do something just for human rights. It's like, tell me why I should care again. Like what's the <laughs> economics? What's this? You know. So it's like it's this major contradiction we have in terms of how we feel about our system and what we want to do to pursue it abroad. Oh my gosh! I you know time is always our enemy. I just in the conversation in the last fifteen minutes, I've written down five more questions, but unfortunately we don't have time for that. Hopefully the next time uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, Liza will come back with us. Uh, for another discussion on uh, the international community, international rights, uh, uh, international relations uh, here. So hopefully we can get to some of those other questions. Uh, but uh, let's close as we traditionally do, and that is uh, with final thoughts, insights, recommendations to students and teachers uh, as they develop uh, their uh, their approach to these uh, questions. Chris, I know you have to go real quick. Uh, any final insights or thoughts? Um, yeah, I think this, this, you know, I, at first, when I first read this question, I was not super sold on it, but after listening to Eliza and you guys, I'm, uh, definitely more, I think this is a really rich question for kids to students, uh, to take in so many different ways. And this is, uh, I think this is a, a question that will allow a lot of passion. You know, I was talking about passion, knowledge, and reasoning. This is this is a good place for students to let that passion come out, but make sure your arguments are grounded. I mean, you know, make sure your arguments are grounded in history that we've tried to reach on, and uh, looking backwards as well as looking forward. Clearly, there's a lot going on in the world right now that will uh, lend itself to this question. Um, so let that passion come out in this question, but always make sure that passion is grounded in uh, solid arguments. Thank you, Professor Kavanaugh. Professor Moore. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i really taken with the second bullet in this question because uh, it gives you like, I don't know, three or four different silos to think about. Um, and I, I really I really like that, that second bullet. Uh, it, it's something like what are the cultural and, and uh, social, all these, all these, uh, it's like, how do you bake the cake kind of question? What's all in this? Uh, I think that's a really great, part of this question and, and frankly uh, if if I was your coach and teacher I'd have you do most of your research on that second on that second bullet 
because I think it gets to this cultural thing we've been talking about. Do you know? Do cultures create constitutions, or do constitutions create cultures? That 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 bullet is really, uh, I think, fascinating. So uh, my my advice, maybe it's not good advice, <laughs> but but camp out on that second bullet, Professor Williams. Yeah, I agree with what Tim just said a lot, and I would um. I would say, like, really kind of study some case studies. We've, we've talked about some of these comparative constitutions, and I would definitely look at those. But then I think it'd be super interesting to to look at the state constitutions in the 1790s and, and look at some of those and think about those compared to the U.S. Constitution compared to the comparative ones now. I, I think there's many different ways you could think of your case studies. So don't limit yourself to just international. Think about the different cultures and constitutionalisms we have in the United States itself. And Liza. Um, I would just offer two resources that I think um, hopefully might be helpful uh, for students and teachers. One is the Varieties of Democracy Index. Um, it's a really great academically based, um, they, they do a series of studies uh, every year and on their studies on, on different countries. Um, it's a really kind of interesting, very, very academic and, and data-driven way to understand kind of different, um, how different countries are progressing along sort of, as they call it, varieties of democracy. Um, I can include that as a resource. The second, the Bureau of Democracy, Human rights and labor at the U.S. Department of State produces human rights reports every year. Um, it's really interesting. Um, you can kind of get a, a, a quick overview and snapshot um, of each country in the world they're required uh, by Congress to pr produce these reports. Um, it's also conceptually interesting that Congress has kind of built in this structure where the State Department has to report on human rights in the world. So it's just an interesting resource. And I hope those are both helpful. Well, I'll, I just, you know, concur with everything that's been said and just suggest I mean, I, I appreciate what uh, Dr. Williams uh, said, but uh, I, I do think you have to be familiar uh, with some uh, constitutions around the world, especially, you know, as I think we ferreted out that uh, the United States has a greater influence in the Western Hemisphere. So knowing uh, what we didn't know, uh, you know, do some of these countries have Bill of Rights uh, beyond Mexico, uh, uh, there might be a good idea for uh, teachers uh, uh, to help their students with. Uh, so hopefully uh, you've walked away with uh, some uh, perspective and knowledge you didn't have before. At, at minimum, we've given you a reading list from our favorite books of our youth that uh, you might want to explore. Uh, and so until we see you next time, peace, love, yogurt, tacos, bye-bye, bye-bye.